Numbers, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 31. For their rock is not our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. Now, what he's saying here is their God is not our God. Their security is not our security. Their strength is not our strength. That is a great sermon text. You could just kind of go crazy with that if you ever wanted to preach on it. Their rock is not our rock. But uh, one thing about it, here in the early Word of God, the people of Israel have already seen the value of the similitude of rocks to God, both in the true sense and in the false sense. Their rock is not as our rock. Now, we find in chapter 10 of uh, 1 Corinthians that this rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus. Now, tonight, I want us to see what we can learn from rocks in the Old Testament. And by the way, I assure you that by no means have we exist, exhausted the thoughts about rocks in the Bible. There's plenty left for you to use for other things. We're talking about rocks that, we're, that are simply confined to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, first of all, if you go to Matthew chapter 7, Jesus Christ recommended rocks as a uh, wise place to build a house. You know the text in Matthew chapter 7, after our Lord had given the Sermon on the Mount, he concluded it by saying, a person who takes these sayings of mine and obeys them is like a person who builds a house upon a rock. Now obviously people had built on sand and on rocks and both of them knew the, the consequences. And then over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Jesus Christ is called the foundation of the church. Paul said, as a wise master builder, I have laid that foundation. And he says, the foundation is Christ, and we are to take heed how we build upon it. So in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, if you build upon these sayings of mine, it's like a man that built his house on a rock. And then Paul says that Christ is that foundation, and that you and I are to build upon it. So rocks were recommended as a good place to build. What better place could a person build his life than on the Lord Jesus Christ? That is the solid foundation. All other ground is sinking sand. And so Christ is the rock upon which every human being must build his life if it is to stand in the time of testing. Notice again, rocks in the Old Testament were used as places of refuge. In 2 Samuel chapter 22, 2 Samuel <clears throat> chapter 22, Samuel is talking about God himself. And in this chapter, in verse 2, he said, And the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. God is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. God is all of those things. Now, it's interesting that a rock becomes a fortress. Haven't we sung the song, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me? What do you do in the cleft of a rock? You hide in it. Let me hide myself in thee. And so a rock, many times, would be the place of a fortress. I like these Western cowboy movies. I like to, you know, the bullets flying and ricocheting off of the rocks, you know, and, and I like those. I, I hate these urban cowboy things. I think they're sissy. I like those kind where the fellows, they climb way up the top of the rocks and they get up there and they fight and they roll down and some guy hides behind a rock and the bullets are ricocheting around. And every time I see some old boy hiding back in a rock, I'm reminded of this, this concept. A rock is a good place to hide. Rocks become a great fortress. The conies, the hare, they hide themselves among the rocks, the Bible said. Rocks is a good place to hide. The animals know that. And anybody who's got any sense is going to hide in the rock of ages. In verse 3 of the same text, it says, The God, the God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my savior, thou savest me from violence. How did he do it, David? Well, I hid in a rock. 
And many times when David was running from Saul, he found himself hiding in caves among the rocks. I've seen those caves. And David would hide himself there. And as David would look at these rocks and look at these hiding places, he recognized that God was his security. And uh, he likened these to God himself. In verse 47 of the same text, verse 47, uh, he says, The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. And the salvation here that David is not, not talk, is, uh, talking about is not the forgiveness of his sins as you and I experience salvation, but he is talking about salvation of deliverance from his enemies. Salvation of deliverance from his enemies, primarily from Saul and his armies. And uh, David, every time he was delivered, had a praise service. Now, if you go over to chapter, or also to, yes, to chapter 23 and verse 3. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake unto me. He that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. It's amazing how many times this rock as a type of God comes up. It's all through the Bible. Amazing how many times God is referred to as a rock. A rock was a secure place to build. The rock was a logical place to hide, uh, let it yielding itself as a fortress. Go over to Psalm with me, uh, Psalm chapter 18, Psalm 18 and verse 31, 18:31. For who is God save the Lord, and who is a rock save our God? Well, what is a rock? It's a place to build. Christ is that rock we found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If any man build upon this foundation, uh, if any man builds on any other foundation, it's sinking sand. So their rock is not our rock. You know, a lot of times you, you see these in these plays, and you see these boulders come tumbling down and falling on people. I've seen those boulders. Guess what they are? They're styrofoam, you see? And that's all their rocks amount to styrofoam. They have no power. They have no security. You read about it this morning in the Old Testament, the book of Jeremiah, when the Bible says, be not dismayed at the heavens. Their rock is nothing but styrofoam. It can't hurt you. And many times we're fearful of that which appears, which is not. And so here we find then in Psalm chapter 18 in verse 31, he says, for who is a God save the Lord, or who is a rock save our God? No other security, no place to build, no hiding place other than in the Lord God. Look at verse 31. I'm sorry, verse 47. It is God that uh, avengeth me and subdueth the people under me. Well, let's see. I better find the right one here. Verse 46, the Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, the God of my salvation be exalted. And then, <clears throat> if you go over to chapter 62 in the same book, chapter 62, and verse, uh, verse 2, 62 and verse 2, he only is my rock and my salvation, he is my defense, I shall not be greatly moved. Building on a rock, hiding in the rock. Look at verse 7. In God is my salvation and my glory. And by the way, the salvation again is not the forgiveness of sins in this text. It's talking about a fortress, a place to hide. The rock of my strength, my refuge is in God. Christ is that rock, the Bible says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The rock is Christ. Their rock is not our rock. Jesus said, the wise place to build is on a rock, and that rock is my sayings. And Paul said, I've laid the foundation. Every man is to take heed how he builds thereupon. That foundation is Jesus Christ. So the smartest thing you can do in starting your life is a good foundation, putting a building in the right place. Now you can put a beautiful building in the wrong place and you're in big trouble. You can put an ugly building in the right place and it still will be suitable and stand the storm. And it's better to have an inferior house in a good place than to have a superior looking house in the wrong place. 
building on the right place, the right thing is the right thing to do. And then hiding in the right thing, having the, your security in the right place. Their rock is not our rock. What is our security? Is it the next governmental system? What is our security? Is it social security? What is our security? Is it our job? What is our security? Is it our health? What is our security? Is it our talent? What is our security? Is it your looks? What is your security? It should be the rock, God, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the place where you need to hide and you need to build. All other ground is sinking sand. All other rocks are styrofoam. Notice again, if you will, in chapter 40 of the book of Psalms, a rock was a place of stability. In chapter 40, you know the story, David was in a horrible pit. Now this is not just a spiritualization of the text. Slime pits were dug and left for animals and for enemies. Many times, these pits would have oil that would ooze to the surface. These pits eventually would catch drain off water. These pits would be where animals would fall and die. These pits would be where certain venomous snakes and, and reptiles would, would hide. These pits sometimes were overlaid with branches and they were places where uh, uh, enemies would be pursued and there they would be trapped. These pits were places where you would put people and keep them in safety or in keeping until you desired to pull them out. Example, you remember the story of Joseph and his brethren and how that when Joseph came into the field to look for his brethren, they took him, they were going to kill him, and they put him in keeping until the time appointed to kill him. You know what they put him in? Put him in a pit, an abandoned hole or a well perhaps that had been dug. David knew the experience of falling into these horrible pits. And he said in Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto my, and heard my cry, and brought me up also out of a horrible pit. And he has set my feet on a solid rock, on a solid rock. Now, the other day I, I was up here Saturday and I watched some boys over here, Brother Ben and I watched some boys. They rode their bicycles down here and those guys walked out into this mud over here. Now, they were up to their knees in that mud. They would walk out barefooted, they'd have to go back in and get their boots. And I'm just curious as to what kind of story they told their mother. I'm sure they all said somebody pushed me or something of that nature. But here these fellows were in mud up to their knees. And uh, in these pits, uh, as I've described them, you would find all kinds of m m murky and uh, slimy water and dead animals and creeping things that you don't like. And David said, I called unto the Lord and he brought me out and he set me on a solid rock. He established my goings, put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God. And so this rock is a rock of stability. It's where you ought to stand. You know, the Bible says, having done all stand, you know, anybody can stand. You really can. There's no reason you should turn tail in the heat of battle. You can stand. Paul said, if any man draw back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. John Mark was a coward and ran in the heat of the battle. Lot's wife looked back. Uh, Ephraim turned back in the day of battle. God has nothing good to say about a person who will not stand. Nothing commendable about the individual who will not go forward and who will not stand. Nothing good does God have to say for that individual. Nothing. You're on a rock. You can stand if you want to. Everybody's on that rock. Everybody is in that rock. We are in him. We are to build upon him. He is the place of stability, and he is the place where you and I can stand if we choose to do so. Not only that, in Psalm 78, David pushes the type a little bit further. In Psalm chapter 78, <clears throat> a rock was a source of living water. Now, it's not uncommon. It's not uncommon to see, well, it is uncommon, but, but it happens, to see water coming from a rock. Uh, here in the desert, David tells about the people of Israel being supplied water. If you look at 78 and verse uh, 15, it says, He clave the rocks in the wilderness, 
and gave them drink out of great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like a river. Now there can be no question about who this rock is. The context in 1 Corinthians 10 is talking about this rock. And it says that rock was Christ. Jesus himself said that he that thirst, let him come to me and drink. Jesus said that out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. He said to the woman at the well, he that drinks of this water shall thirst again. But if he drinks of the water that I shall give him, he shall never thirst. And she said, Lord, give up me this water that I come not here to draw nor thirst again. No question about water being the source and the sustaining of life. Now, if you go back to the Old Testament a little bit further, back to Exodus chapter 17, you'll see the, the reference that David was talking about there in Psalm 78. Exodus chapter 17 and verse 6. Exodus 17, 6. Behold, I will stand. God is saying, talking to, to Moses. Behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come, out, come water out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of that place Massa and Meribah because of, the children of the, uh, because of the chiding of the children of Israel. And because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Now here we see a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. A rock was a place to build. A rock was the foundation that Paul admonished us to build upon. A rock is a place of refuge, a place to hide, hiding in thee. A rock, according to Psalm 40, was a place of stability. The child of God is to stand. David was set upon a, stood upon a solid rock. A rock was a source of living water, a place where you can be refreshed and drank to the full. And when you start drinking of the blessings from the Son of God, you'll find the end of the horn is hooked into God's supply, and it will never run short. So that rock then was a source when it was smitten of living water. Notice he said, you shall smite the rock. And Moses took that rod, and he hit the rock, and God opened it up and caused water to come out of it. Now, not only that, not only that, after the rock had been smitten, thereafter it only needed to be spoken to, and a person could have a continuous supply. The thing about being saved is you must take the first drink, and after you are saved, you must continue to drink if you are to grow spiritually in the Lord Jesus Christ and to have the strength that God intended for you to have. Let's go to Numbers chapter 20, and we'll see the very sin that Moses committed that kept him out of the promised land. And it had to do with a rock. Numbers chapter 20 and verse 7. Here we have a new generation. Keep in mind, in Exodus chapter 17, you have the first generation that came out of Egypt into the wilderness. And this generation, over 21 years of age, began to complain and said, Is God among us? And God said to Moses, he said, I'm going to stand up on the rock, and I want you to smite that rock, and when you do, water will come out of it. Well, now they go on. They've drunk the water. They go on now. They get up to Kadesh Barnea. They refuse to go into the promised land. And God said, all right, since you're going to go back into the wilderness, and you, your excuse for not going on was you used your kids as an excuse. Listen to what they said. Our little ones are going to die in there. And so God said, all right, since you use your little ones as an excuse, we'll just let you die in the wilderness, and I'll send your little ones on in. So he turned them around at Kadesh Barnea, and for 40 years now they wander in the wilderness. And every one over 21 years of age, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, die in the wilderness. They all die. Now then, while they're in the wilderness, they begin to complain again. 
and Moses got upset with their complaining. The meekest man on the earth lost his temper and lost out on going into the promised land. And here you have it in verse 7 of chapter 20. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother. You see the word speak? And speak unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so that thou shalt give the congregation and their beast drink. Look at the disobedience in verse 9. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we fetch water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his rod in his hand. And with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank in their beast. Look at verse 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, said, Because you believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I gave to them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in their eyes. And you go ahead and read the text. The reason Moses didn't take this congregation in is because he disobeyed the Lord. Now, what was the disobedience? The disobedience was a great leader disobeying God in the eyes of the congregation and destroying the type of smiting the rock. Now, if you ever read the book of Hebrews, if you have read it, then you already know that Jesus Christ died once and for all. There remaineth no more sacrifice. He never has to die again. And you've heard the story about the prairie fires and how that a man on a horse cannot outrun a good prairie fire. Sometimes they move 30 and 40 miles an hour going across the prairie, eating everything up in their path. And a wise man or a farmer will go out and he will set a fire. And he will let that fire, it, that fire will blow in the same direction as the prairie fire that's on its way. And then uh, as the fire burns off the standing grass, that man and his horse will stand in the area where the fire was that he himself set. And when the oncoming prairie fire reaches the end of the grass, or the prairie grass, there, it has no more fuel, and there the fire stops. And there is nothing around that man that consume him, can consume him, because the fire has already burned where he is standing. Now, Jesus Christ was smitten of God when he died on the cross. He took the wrath of God, he took the payment of our sin, and he never has to take it again. And no one else ever has to take it. All you need to do is stand where the fire has already burned, and there's nothing can touch you. That's why the Bible makes it so clear that a child of God is not condemned. It's absolutely impossible for you to be condemned. No way could you be condemned. It's absolutely impossible. And so, when Moses hit the rock twice, he broke the perfect type of salvation, and he disobeyed God. God said, speak to the rock. Now, the rock doesn't have to be smitten again. All you have to do to be saved is speak to it. All you have to do is to have the living water, now that you are saved, is speak to it. For whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that what it says? The Bible said, Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name? Ask, and you shall receive that your joy may be full. Isn't that what it says? The Bible said, Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Isn't that what it says? So you don't have to hit it again. It's already been smitten for you. And all that has to be done is we have to speak to the rock to have the blessings of God in our life. And so we find then that Jesus said a rock is the best place to build. And he says that rock is the teaching that I am giving you. Paul said that Jesus is the foundation. And every child of God needs to take heed how he builds on that foundation. David says that a rock is a refuge, a place to hide. And Jesus Christ is our refuge, rock of ages cleft for me. A rock is a place of stability where you ought to plant your feet and not be blown about by every wind of doctrine. You ought to become stable. We're living in a transit society. Nobody, very few people, have any plans of staying anywhere. 
Now, that, you know, that's not the way God operates. When God brought the children of Israel into the promised land, the land was never to be sold. They were never to move the landmarks. And too many of us are caught up in the running to and fro of society and building unstable churches and families that are not stable and lives that are not stable because we make no plans to stay anywhere. Family said to me the other day, they said, well, uh, Brother Pat, you were with me. The family said to me the other day, they said, yes, we're saved. We've moved up here from such and such a place. We visited your church. We like it. But our job is down uh, here a ways, and we're just not sure if we're going to be staying at this end of the town or the other end. I said, well, you going to be here next Sunday? They said, yeah. I said, well, why don't you join next Sunday? Too many people, you see, folks don't know. They, they, they don't know what they're going to do. They have no plans to stay anywhere. Now, you need to make plans to stay where you are until God from heaven boots you out. Amen. You should not be making plans to move and say, I'll stay if God keeps me here. That's not the way you ought to operate. You ought to say, I'm here and I'm going to stay until God tells me to leave. Two, I don't know, how many of you got the sword of the Lord? Did you get the sword of the Lord? Did you read Dr. Hiles' sermon? Isn't that a great sermon? See, too many people are worrying about the where to serve God and not worrying about the what. Now, you ought to read that sermon. I've got a copy. I'll sell you if you're interested. But nevertheless, listen, listen. Stability is a thing taught in the Bible from the beginning. I am the Lord. I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Some people change churches more often than they change their kids. Change jobs more often than they change oil in their car. The Bible warns about being with people given to change. That's what it says. You are to be cautious of people who are given to change. You say, you think folks ought to change? Yeah, I think the book ought to change you. That's how, that's how you ought to be changed. The Bible, if anything, if a rock implies anything, it implies stability. Stability. Stable in what you believe. Stable in where you live. Stable in where you work. Stable in your relationships with people. Stable in your ethics. Stable. That's the theme of the Word of God when it talks about rocks. And that's what a rock implies. A foundation. A place to hide. Stability. It was a place to look for water. It was a place that we needed to only speak to. Now then, something else about the Lord Jesus Christ in reference to a rock, if you'll go to 1 Peter. Rocks can also be a problem. They give migraine headaches. For reference, see Goliath. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 8. A rock can be a stumbling stone. Now, my kids get embarrassed when I start reminiscing about my childhood, but um, that's okay. They'll have their turn. But, you know, you have never had an experience until you've run over an Arkansas hillside with no shoes on and at about 20 miles an hour drop kicked a rock. I mean, you talk about yipping like a Comanche on one leg. And you'd run around be holding that foot, and the next thing, you know, you'd go to school and you'd see some guy, <laughs> you'd see some guy with a big old, big old rag tied around his big toe, you know. It looked like a Christmas gift, his foot. But, but really, I've seen big old white rags tied around the, a big toe, you know, try to keep the nail on, and sometimes the nail is gone. I mean, I've seen them kick, and the nail would just lift up in the back, and it was all over. Now, listen, boy, rocks can be tough. And, uh... Of course, you folks will never experience that because, you, you know, you were ruined. You had shoes at the time you were a year old, you know, and your mother was putting shoes on you and ruining you from that kind of experience. But they, I'm sure Simon Peter knew what, knew what it was because here in chapter 2 and verse 8, he refers to the Lord being a type of a rock. He says that it is a stone of stumbling, a stone of stumbling. Now, rocks, of course, have a lot of value, but sometimes rocks can be a problem if you don't watch where you're going. And when you don't watch where you're going, Jesus becomes a real problem. And he is the one over uh, whom the Jews and the Gentiles stumbled. They stumbled over him. That is, they, uh, they found him a source of problems in their 
forward uh, direction. When they were trying to make progress, Jesus got in the way. And so it is today with, uh, with what we call culture. Jesus of the Bible is a hindrance to progressive evolution and uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, to the religious Pharisees. And so he is a stumbling stone, gets in the way. People fall over him. Pilate, they said, what, will I, what shall I do with Jesus? He tried to wash his hands, but it didn't do him any good. Also, in Ephesians chapter 2, in Ephesians chapter 2, Jesus is called a cornerstone. A cornerstone. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. It says, And you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, I don't know much about building, but I know that if you don't get the corners straight, you've got some problems. You've got to get the corners straight. Uh, you can be off just a half an inch or an inch at the corner, and you travel 120 feet, and you've got real problems. You know, you start out with a building down here that's uh, 50 feet wide, but, but maybe the, each corner is off just an inch, one going north and the other one going south. Guess what you're going to have when you get down there 120 feet? You're going to have a 50-foot building at this end and a 75-foot building at the other end. And the cornerstone has to be right. Cornerstone speaks of square. The Bible talks about an equal balance. And uh, the cornerstone is the stone around which we are to build our lives. He is the one that is to keep the building straight. How do you do that? Well, what you do is you have to keep everything in line with the cornerstone. It has its 90 degrees. And the rest of the building is to line up with the cornerstone and not the other way around. And too many, too many people are, <laughs> I build a, I uh, poured this foundation right out here. If you want to ever have a, uh, a, a fun time, just go out and look at that foundation. Brother Hughes, you helped, didn't you? Yeah. That is the worst thing I've ever seen out there. It's the foundation that's under the bus barn, that back wall. I forget how many feet it's off from one end to the other. And uh, we were able finally to get uh, a building company to come in and bail us out. They said, we can't salvage the foundation, but we'll make the wall on top, you know. And so if you go out there and look at that, you'll notice the wall on one end is about four feet different than the other end. Since they couldn't adjust the foundation, they just adjusted the building. I mean, it is, it is a, <laughs> well, couldn't get any help. And uh, so, <clears throat> so anyway, build it right, build it square, and uh, build it around the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, Peter refers to him also as the cornerstone there in 1 Peter chapter 2. There's something else about the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says that stone is Christ. Let's go to Matthew 21. Matthew chapter 21, verse 43. Matthew 21, 43. Jesus said unto them, Did you never read in the Scripture the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. There can be no question about who the stone is and what he's talking about. Jesus came as the king, Jesus came as the savior. He came as the lamb of God. He came preaching the acceptable year of the Lord. That's what he offered. But when he returns, he will come as a stone. And he will come in judgment with blood upon his garments, king of kings and lord of lords. And if you read Psalm chapter 2, it says that he will have a rod in his hand and he will smite the nations as one who smites a vessel. 
and out of his mouth will come a sharp two-edged sword. Woe be to that person on whom that stone falls. And then last of all, this rock, the Lord Jesus Christ, refers to a kingdom. Let's go to Daniel chapter 2, please. Daniel chapter 2. And verse 35. Then was the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken in pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away and there was no place found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now there is a prophecy of the, the destination of Gentile powers, political powers. Daniel is called the head of gold. Then there is the breast, breast uh, uh, of silver, and that would be the Medes and the Persians. Then there was, you have the loins of this image of brass referring to the Greeks. Then you have the legs of iron and clay, or iron, referring to the Roman Empire, and then the feet of iron and clay. No question about this talking about Gentile world powers. And in the last days of those kingdoms, interesting, in the feet, the last of the kingdoms, the way they're going to end is with Jesus Christ, the stone cut out without hands. And that stone is going to come and hit the image in the feet. And all the Gentile powers are going to crumble and they'll be blown away as chaff. And the Lord Jesus Christ, that rock, will grow into a kingdom, a mountain. And, and by the way, it's not a process. It will be turned into a kingdom that will fill the whole earth. And Daniel says, the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. All right, by way of review. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 said, And that rock that followed them was Christ. First of all, a rock was the proper place to build. Jesus likened his teaching. Paul likened Christ to a foundation upon which you and I are to build. A rock was a place of refuge, a place to hide. Christ is our hiding place. A rock is a place of stability. David stood on a solid rock. And we should take our stand on the Lord Jesus Christ. A rock in the Old Testament was a source of living water, smitten, and water came forth and provided life for the people of God. The rock thereafter was to be spoken to. Again, this rock becomes a stumbling stone. Again, the rock is a cornerstone, giving proper balance to the building. The rock is a crushing stone, a, a rock of judgment. And last of all, the rock becomes a kingdom. Now there are does multitudes of other things that could be said about rocks. It's interesting, when they built the altar, they could not use any tool upon when they built it. They were to bring in rocks as they were and pile those 12 rocks up, making an altar. And if a if a, if a chisel or a hammer was used upon these altars, the altars were polluted. And uh, you would do yourself a favor by starting from the beginning to the end and studying the rocks.